So today's general session will include a keynote talk by Jez Humble, and then our first ever Jenkins World Award Ceremony. What I'd like to do now is introduce our keynote speaker. He's one of the most well-known DevOps leaders and evangelists in the world today. He's affectionately known as one of the godfathers of continuous delivery. He's the co-author of the DevOps Handbook, Lean Enterprise, and also a Jolt Award winner. He spent a lot of time in his career tinkering with code, infrastructure, and helping pro in doing product development across companies across the world. <clears throat> Most recently, he's worked with the federal government on the 18F project, where he's trying to help federal agencies be more efficient in using digital services. He's also currently researching how to build high-performance teams in startups. And in fact, his own startup, Dora, DevOps Research and, an, and Assessment, there he's working with Dr. Nicole Forsgren, doing some phenomenal research and analysis on DevOps. And Nicole's here as well. Nicole, can you stand? Say hi to everybody. <clears throat> So without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the Jenkins World Stage, Jez Humble. Thanks so much. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, what a fabulous morning here in San Francisco, as always. It's just lovely. Uh, so I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes talking about DevOps, uh, why you should care about it if you don't already care about it, although here you are, so presumably you do care about it, um, how it's going to help make things uh, better than they already are. I'm going to dive into the core principles and practices behind DevOps and continuous delivery because, uh, as I've discovered talking about this for <laughs> over 15 years now, uh, new people enter the industry every year uh, who need to know the basics and how to apply it in principle. I'm going to talk about some common obstacles to implementing these ideas and how to overcome them uh, and finish up by talking about the journey. So who here works in a company of 10 people or less? A few startup people. OK, 10 to 100 people. OK, that's a bigger chunk of you. 100 to 1,000? OK, lots of you. 1,000 uh, to 10,000? Wow, some big enterprise type people. Uh, 10,000 to 100,000? OK, 100,000 to a million? Well, a few hands going up here. More than a million, anyone? Anyone working for the People's Liberation Army or uh, Indian Railways? OK, so that's a big chunk of kind of enterprise, big company kind of people. So uh, I've made a, a diagram of the enterprise here. So you can see on the left, there's the golf playing class. And then in the middle, you've got the engineers. And then there's IT operations on the right. Any IT operations and infrastructure people here? A few of you. OK, great. And not all at the back, so that's also good. Um, Martin Fowler assures me that that diagram on the top right is valid UML for the big ball of mud that you're running in production. This isn't a particularly bad enterprise. We don't have outsourcing or separate testing organizations. Um, but there's still some problems with that. Um, we have the machine that goes ping, that tells you that everything's working. What happens when we press play on this diagram? Well, the unit of work in the enterprise is the project. And the way a project works is some, someone comes back from the golf course after a particularly fine round with an idea for a, an amazing new product that we're going to build. And then months pass as we go through the budgeting cycle and analysis and estimation and all this kind of stuff. And eventually, a project plan lands on some poor project manager's desk. Boom! And then the development team spends months or even years building that thing before tossing it over the wall into uh, production where it gets wired up. Uh, we check it works. And then the team that built that thing goes off and does something completely different instead. And the thing that they built lives forever in production because nothing ever gets, gets retired. So there are many problems with this model, not least of which is the fact that it takes so long to get anything done. And of course, we know the magic bullet for this problem. It's agile. So we're all going to go agile. Yay! 
and uh, everyone goes on the two-day scrum course, and now we're taking orders from management standing up instead of sitting down, and that huge backlog of work that we can never complete is now prioritized and estimated, and uh, we're agile, woo! How do we think the rest of the organization reacts to the exciting news of the agile transformation? Are they filled with joy and delight in anticipation of this? Not normally the case. Um, firstly, I mean, the whole point of Agile is better collaboration between business and engineering. That means less time on the golf course, which is, you know, unfortunate uh, for the business people. They need to come and visit the engineers more often, which is bad because they're on the kind of engineering floors with no windows, not the nice kind of executive suites. Um, and then, you know, it's not great for the developers either because, you know, the whole reason you become a developer is so you don't have to talk to other people. And now, Here's the executives wanting to come and talk to you about requirements all the time, so that's, that's unpleasant. Um, IT operations is also not thrilled about this because instead of some nasty piece of crap coming over the wall into production once a year, now we have stuff coming over the wall all the time into production. Oh no, stop the madness. Um, and, you know, IT operations is, please stop doing this. Uh, and the engineers are like, what are you talking about? We're doing TDD. Uh, we, we have solid engineering practices, uh, everything's nicely encapsulated and loosely coupled. And IT operations is like, well, that's great. Shame it doesn't actually work. And it's important to bear in mind, IT operations has an entirely logical and natural reaction to this problem. And that is to create a barrier to stop all this stuff coming their way. Uh, and that barrier is called the change management process. And the job of the change management process is to make sure that nothing ever changes. <laughs> so who, who, who has a friend who works in a company like this? <laughs> okay, probably everyone who works in a company of more than 10 people. Um, so this is the problem that we're trying to solve with DevOps. Um, this kind of miserable downward spiral that Agile has, uh, in many cases, failed to really fix. Um, I'm not going to give you a definition of DevOps because, frankly, uh, A, we're still evolving as a community. We're still coming up with new ideas and new practices to help uh, address this problem. What I am going to give you is a kind of historical characterization because I think it's best understood in terms of the history. Agile as a movement evolved as a response to these kind of very heavyweight processes for getting software products delivered, which took a really long time and were very inefficient. Um, DevOps evolved in, in reaction to a different problem, which is that we had to build these distributed systems at enormous scale that had to be secure and resilient, but also had to change all the time. And that's the problem that DevOps sets out to solve. We're a community of practice trying to solve this problem. How do you build resilient, secure, large-scale distributed systems that you can keep changing? Continuous delivery, um, which is kind of my, my gig, um, is about one of the outcomes we're trying to achieve. The idea of continuous delivery is about being able to make changes to your production environment boring. Who in the audience, when you do um, a release, you have to work evenings or weekends in order to do that release? Okay, that's quite a lot of you. Um, so the reason that me and Dave Farley wrote the continuous delivery book in 2010 was because we'd worked with a whole bunch of people who'd solved that problem. So the first release that I worked on in 2006 um, when I started doing this stuff. Uh, the first release was the weekend, and then we never had to go in at the weekend again because we found ways to make it so you could deploy during normal business hours at the push of a button and do roll forward and roll back in, in less than 100 milliseconds. And that's why we wrote the book, so no one would ever have to do deployments at evenings and weekends again. So sadly, we appear to have failed, so sorry about that, um, but I think the thing to bear in mind is that is a sign that something is wrong. We shouldn't accept deployments at evenings and weekends as inevitable. It's not. It's a sign that something is wrong, and it's a sign that you have work to do to fix that problem so that you don't 
have to do that anymore. That's my most important metric for continuous delivery, number of person hours spent outside of business hours doing releases. And the goal for that is zero. So this talk is called the DevOps Transformation. Why is DevOps transformational? Well, what's the transformation? Well, we're used to thinking about delivering software in terms of the Iron Triangle. You've got a fixed schedule, you've got resources, you've got scope, and then if you want to change any of those things, um, it's going to impact quality. And so software delivery is fundamentally a trade-off. It's a zero-sum game, and you're going to optimize somewhere within that trade-off. Well, actually, what we've shown is that we can change the game, that we don't have to treat this as a set of trade-offs anymore. And my favorite example for this is Amazon. So these stats are a few, old, uh, a few years old now. Amazon is at least one order of magnitude better than this now. But they're making changes to deployment, uh, sorry, changes to production on average every 11.6 seconds. That's the time between deployments. And this is 2011. Up to 1,079 deployments in an hour. On average, 10,000 boxes receiving those deployments, up to 30,000 boxes receiving those deployments. So this is aggregated across the thousands of services that make up Amazon's production environment, but nevertheless, extremely impressive. And it shows what you can do, even working on a large-scale distributed system. So fundamentally, they've changed the game. You don't have to accept this idea that releases have to only happen every month, and you have to spend the weekend in the data center. It doesn't have to be like that. So Nicole and I, along with Gene Kim and the Puppet team, have been working on the State of DevOps report for the last few years. We have a ton of data on actually how you do this and the practices that en enable it. And what we found is a really nice way to measure IT performance. And we have four variables that we discovered um, together are both valid and reliable. Um, and this has been the case for several years now. So we're, we're, we're pretty solid that these variables are actually useful as a way of measuring IT performance. We measure four things. Lead time for changes, how long it takes to go from version control to production. Release frequency, how often you release. And those two are throughput metrics. That's the measure of how fast you can go. And then we have two stability metrics. Time to restore service when there's an outage or a service degradation. How long does it take you to get back up and running again? And then change fail rate. When you push out a change, what percentage of the time do you have to remediate or um, roll back or whatever it is you do? If you take one thing away from this presentation, it should be this. High performers do better at both. They are not making trade-offs. What we find in the high performing group is that they can deploy on demand, typically multiple times a day takes them less than an hour to get changes live. They can also restore service in less than an hour, and their change fail rate is really low. Whereas if you look at the low performers, they're releasing typically on you know, monthly basis or less frequently. It takes them about that long to get changes out because all their changes are batched up into these big releases. Um, it, it typically takes them of the order of hours to restore service, and their change fail rate is higher as well. The practices and principles of DevOps and continuous delivery that enable high performance, it's not about making a trade-off. It's about getting better at going fast. And going fast is actually what enables you to be safe. The same practices enable higher quality and lower costs and higher stability and higher speed if you're doing it right. Fundamentally, we've changed the game. Of these statistics, the one that I think is least frequently measured is lead time. Like Everyone knows how fast you deploy. Everyone knows your time to restore, uh, hopefully. Um, but lead time is, is hard to measure and not often measured. But it's really, really important. Why is it important? It tells you how quickly you can restore service if something goes down. Well, how you know what the fix is. You've got to put the fix out. How long is it going to take you? Well, whatever your lead time is. If you have to get a critical fix to users because there's a critical defect, how quickly are you going to be able to get that fix out? Uh, it also tells you how quickly you can get feedback from uh, production or from production-like testing. And then I think another way in which this is transformational is 
High performers are running experiments in production all the time with new features. When they have an idea for a new feature, they don't just go and build the whole thing out in a project and then release it and then find out if it was the right thing to build. Instead, you build a prototype, you push it into production, you run A-B tests, you gather data, you find out if it's really valuable to your business, and then you go and build it out by building the, rest, the other 80% of the feature, which makes it support all the different browsers, makes it scale, adds all the edge cases that you care about, um, all, all those kinds of things. Data from people who've been doing this at scale is really sobering. Uh, there's a paper by Ronika Harvey who ran Amazon's experimentation platform before going to Microsoft. Now he runs Microsoft's experimentation platform. He has loads of data from A-B tests. Evaluating well-designed and executed experiments that were designed to prove, improve a key metric, only about one-third was successful. If you extrapolate that, that means that two-thirds of the features that we build deliver zero or negative value to our business. You could spend two-thirds of your time on the beach or surfing and deliver the same value to your customers if only you knew the two-thirds of the features that you're building that are delivering zero or negative value to your business. So this is the end game for DevOps and continuous delivery. It's about being able to work in very small batches, build experiments, test them, get feedback, avoid building the things that aren't going to deliver value, and iterate really fast and outcompete and not waste your time building stuff that doesn't matter. So huge benefits that are transformational and provide a competitive advantage for your organization. And again, we have data that shows this is true. High performers at IT are twice as likely to exceed low performers in terms of uh, market share, productivity, these business metrics that we really care about. So DevOps matters. It changes the game. What are the core principles and practices? Who, who works in an organization where you're agile, where you're doing all the agile? OK, lots of you. So in my experience going around lots of different companies, what I find is that the industry standard agile process is uh, something uh, that Dave West calls water scrum fall. And this industry standard process uh, it takes you months to get through like budgeting and uh, you know, estimation and prioritization. And then once work gets to teams, teams are working in these nice iterations, which are lovely, you know, building, testing, all this kind of thing. But you don't release that to users every iteration. Oh, no, no, no. You wait till the whole release is ready, then you integrate it, then you test it, and then you push it out in one miserable, enormous batch at the weekend, and then you go and get drunk and pray that you don't have to do that again for a really long time. So continuous delivery fundamentally is about completely removing this bit at the bottom. The last mile, we want to completely get rid of that. We want to take that work and build it into the development process. And the key motto here comes from W. Edwards Deming. He was one of the founders of the Lean movement, uh, or at least what preceded the Lean movement. Um, he was working in Japan after the Second World War, helping to revive Japanese manufacturing, uh, contributing to, to that. He says, cease dependence on mass inspection to achieve quality. You know, QA in a special QA phase. Improve the process and build quality into the product in the first place. So we should be building quality in. That means everyone is responsible for quality, Testers aren't responsible for quality. Everyone is responsible for quality. And we should be testing that all the time. So who in this audience is practicing continuous integration? OK, hopefully everyone, because we're at Jenkins World. OK, so keep your hands up. I've got a little test I'm going to administer to check you're paying attention. Keep your hands up. Unless all the developers on your team are checking into a shared trunk or master at least once a day, if that's not true, put your hands down. If you're working on long-lived feature branches that don't get merged into a shared trunk or master at least once a day, hands go down. Otherwise, you can keep your hands up. All right. If when the build fails, it's not typically fixed within 10 minutes, put your hands down. Otherwise, you can keep them up. OK. So the people 
with their hands up, are actually doing continuous integration. So big round of applause for those people. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> continuous integration is really hard, and a lot of people redefine it to mean whatever they're already doing. My favorite paper on continuous integration is called Continuous Integration on a Dollar a Day. It's by James Shaw, and it talks about how to do continuous integration using an old workstation, a rubber chicken, and a bell. And here's how it works. So I'm over here with my headphones on, developing a really sweet bit of code. And uh, I'm done with my increment, whatever I'm working on right now. And I'm ready to push it into my shared trunk and share it with the rest of the team. Because of course, version control primarily is a communication tool. Uh, so I want to share my work to find out if my assumptions are right, if it's going to conflict with anyone else. So before I do that, I'm going to run the build and the tests on my machine locally and make sure that I'm not going to break anyone else. Um, so I do that, build on the test pass, yay, I'm awesome. Then at that point, I'm going to see if my changes conflict with anybody else's changes. Hopefully other people have been working while I've been coding. Uh, they've been checking stuff in. So I'm going to pull from trunk uh, onto my machine. And if I'm using distributed version control system, I'm going to do merge. And then I'm going to um, well, check in first and then merge and then check in again, and then run the build and tests. And if those pass, then I'm ready to share my code. And the reason we do this twice is if the build breaks, I want to know, is it my changes that broke it, or is it the merge that broke it? So I want to be able to distinguish those two different scenarios. So then, once I'm ready, everything's working, I'm going to walk over to the old workstation in the corner of the room. And on that old workstation is going to be a rubber chicken. And if there's no rubber chicken, that means someone else is checking in. I'm going to wait for them to finish and bring back the chicken. Then I can check in. So I take the chicken. No one else can check in. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to push my change into that shared trunk or master. Off it goes. And then I'm going to run back to the old workstation here. I'm going to check out from trunk, run it on a machine that's not my machine. Because as we all know, the works on my machine certification is of no value. So run it on another machine, build and test again. And if it passes, then I can ring the bell. Ding, I did something cool. Everyone's like, go jazz, woo. I put the rubber chicken down for the next person to check in. If the build fails, I've got two options. Option one is probably I forgot to check in a file. So go back to my machine, see if I forgot to check something in, and then fix that. If I can't get it fixed within 10 minutes, what's my option two? Revert. It's as easy as git revert. Um, so if you're checking in at 4.50 PM, which is the most popular time to check in, as we all know, um, and the build breaks, so first of all, you've got to stay and make sure the build actually finishes. Don't go home before the build's finished. Um, but if it fails, you know, don't. For goodness sake, don't stay late and try and fix it. Just revert, and then come back the next day uh, and fix it in the morning when you're nice and fresh. I actually worked on a team where, once where if you didn't get your code into trunk by the end of the day, you would just delete it from your working copy. You just like delete your whole day's work. And then you go home, have a really good night's sleep, uh, you go for a jog in the morning, whatever, come back into work. And Almost invariably, you would have much better code written within an hour than everything you wrote the previous day. And you'd be like, oh, this is easy. Oh, this is much nicer. Oh, I'm going to check this in, and it works. Yay. Because guess what? As developers, most of our good thinking happens when we're sleeping or running or in the shower. Uh, that's where I do most of my thinking. Um, and your brain actually needs that background thread running to, to do all the design work, which is the key element of development. This is why making people work 60-hour weeks is really dumb, because then you don't have that background time for your brain to actually process and do thinking that, that makes it, you actually good at writing quality code. So yeah, if you can't fix it, revert. The key thing about continuous integration that a lot of people miss, uh, it's in the name, continuous integration. Everyone has to commit to the shared trunk at least once a day. Otherwise, it's not integration. And so that's the practice and the mindset. Continuous integration is not running Jenkins against your feature branches and then ignoring the build when it goes red. 
Continuous integration is the practice and mindset of making sure that your software is always in a working state and that you're never too far away from trunk so that everyone has a shared understanding of where we are as a team and is not making assumptions that other people are going to conflict with when we come to integrate uh, and test. And then we can completely get rid of that integration and QA phase because it's built into the development process. So the rubber chicken does not scale. The practice and the mindset absolutely does scale. So this is a slide from Google. Google, I mean, and again, this is a few years old, so they're you know, at least 5x this in some areas now, um, between 2 and 5x this. Uh, but at the time, 10,000 developers, 40 plus offices, more than 2,000 projects under development, single monolithic code tree, every, everyone was developing and releasing from a shared trunk or master. Uh, you can go and look at this talk. Um, and they had an enormous suite of automated tests that validated that this stuff works. Um, and again, you know, it helps that Google has more servers than God. Uh, this is very impressive, but this is all because they needed to make sure that their stuff really, really worked. So once we have all these automated tests uh, and people to build quality in, what we want to create is a deployment pipeline. This is where the Jenkins pipeline plugin comes in super useful. Uh, and now it's built into Jenkins, so you don't even need that anymore, uh, which is great. Really excited about that. Um, the idea is here, you have a process to go from version control to live, and you want to model that process. So every time I make a change to anything, that's going to trigger build and unit test running. That's going to be something that gives me feedback in a few minutes. My unit suite, my check-in suite, doesn't want to take more than a few minutes because then no one cares about it. So that's got to run quickly. And if it fails, we fix it straight away. No one should be checking in on a broken build. We should reject any check-in on a broken build unless you're trying to fix the build, obviously. Once you've got a build where the unit tests pass, that is then going to trigger longer running acceptance tests, which might take of the order of tens of minutes. Uh, or possibly longer, in which case you want to parallelize it as much as possible. If that fails, you're not going to stop people checking in, but you are going to have someone working on fixing that straight away, typically a tester and a developer pairing. Um, that's not the tester's problem. That's everyone's problem. We have to be really disciplined about the hygiene. Then once we've passed all the automated tests, we have a build that's going to go downstream to exploratory testing, to performance testing, those more comprehensive kinds of tests that are more resource intensive. But crucially, we don't want to waste our people and our resources on builds that aren't you know, basically fine. You know, we don't want people working on exploratory testing on builds that haven't passed the automated tests uh, because we don't want them messing around with stuff that is not known to work. So as you move right, you have more confidence that it's releasable, but also those kinds of validations and tests are, are more resource intensive um, and, and more expensive to run. So that's the trade-off that we're trying to work with, uh, for, which motivates the deployment pipeline. And again, you want to make this as short as possible. Remember, we're trying to optimize for lead time. So you want to get changes through this as quickly as you possibly can, which means you want the pipeline to be short and deep. So you want to parallelize this stuff as much as possible to get stuff through uh, and find the problems as fast as possible. So all these things are continuous. We're doing all these things all the time. We're not having an exploratory testing phase after dev complete on a feature. We're doing exploratory testing all the time against trunk. And that feedback goes back to the developers, which hopefully are sitting next to you as soon as possible. So everything in this pipeline is happening continuously. It's not phases with handoffs. And there's many different kinds of testing that we're trying to do. There's not just unit tests and acceptance tests. We also have things that can't be automated that we actually need human beings for, things like usability testing, exploratory testing, showcases. Um, crucially, we shouldn't be wasting our valuable people on the things on the left. That can all be automated. My colleague, Neil Ford, has a joke that when human beings do the things that computers could do instead, all the computers get together late at night and laugh at us. Nowhere is that more true than if you have human beings doing things like you know, regression testing. That's a terrible waste of human um, potential and creativity. So your humans should be doing those, those manual things or helping. You know, testers are really important. They serve a vital role in software development. So they're doing those things on the top right and also helping to build and evolve the suites of automated tests, pairing with developers in order to do that. 
And then the stuff on the bottom right, um, performance testing, uh, those kinds of things. You need to be doing those from the beginning because those are the things that validate your architecture. Martin Fowler defines architecture as the things that are hard to change. You don't want to find out, well, I mean, who's done this? Who's got towards, you know, 75% of the way through a project and then run performance tests and then found out that the system is like an order of magnitude off the load that it needs to support? Okay, plenty of you. How, how was that experience for you? Yeah, it's terrible. Ah, oh, because you have to like re-architect off your code base. It's a nightmare. So you want to find that out at the beginning. You want to validate your architecture at the beginning when it's easy to fix those problems, not when you're 75% of the way through. OMG, we need to re-architect the entire code base. Um, so that needs, all this stuff needs to be done all the way through from the beginning. And the way you start off is by getting a little bit of everything in place. You know, start off, build a single feature which is like, I'm alive. Here's the git hash of the commit that this build came from, uh, write a unit test, write a functional test, write a performance test, get that all in Jenkins, running on a simple pipeline, and then as you build out more features, you build out you know, those different suites, but you have the basic template in place from the beginning. That's how you want to start out. The other good news is we don't just do this with our code, we can also do this with our infrastructure and our platform. So, a big piece of DevOps is the idea of infrastructure as code, that rather than messing around with our production systems by logging into consoles and GUIs and uh, building beautiful works of art that if there's a disaster, we can't possibly reproduce because you've got no idea what the various configuration changes were made over the years. Instead, we should be able to reproduce the production state of our environment purely from configuration and scripts in version control. I should be able to create a test environment or a production environment just by running uh, some simple scripts and bam, off it goes. And I should be able to use a production, create a production-like environment on my development workstation for testing purposes using those same scripts. That's the goal. So this stuff works for every part of the stack and we should be using it for every part of the stack. Continuous integration isn't just for your code, it's for your infrastructure, and that is just as important as it is for your code. So, common obstacles. Um, a lot of people focus on tools um, and reorgs in order to solve problems, and people do that because they're nice and tangible and because they're relatively easy to do. And, you know, I'm not going to say tools aren't important. Tools are great. I love tools. We can't do things without tools. Um, but they're not typically the main blockers. The main blockers are culture and architecture. So we actually measured the impacts of culture in the State of DevOps report, and we found that culture impacts IT performance and organizational performance. So culture has a measurable impact on IT performance and organizational performance. The way we measured culture is by using this model from a guy called Ron Westrom. So Westrom is a sociologist who is studying safety outcomes in healthcare and aviation. So these are industries where when things go wrong, people die. So safety critical uh, domains. And he basically says, to get a great safety culture, you need to make sure the right information is with the right people at the right time in a way that they can understand it. And he created a typology of organizations based on whether they were bureaucratic, pathological, or generative. And you can probably look at this and work out roughly where you are on this spectrum um, pretty easily. And there's six axes here. Number one is cooperation. How effectively do people cooperate with each other? Or is it, you know, the devs blame the operations people, the operations blame the devs um, when things go wrong, and you definitely don't go and talk to each other because you probably just say horrible things. Um, so how, how effectively do people cooperate to get stuff done? How do we deal with bad news? When people bring us bad news, do we shoot them? Uh, do we ignore them? Or do we actively train people to bring us bad news as soon as possible so we can act on it? Do your managers just give green status reports every week to senior management 
until it's very clear that everything is catastrophically bad and then it goes red and then you know bad things happen? Or are we surfacing issues right from the beginning and getting them fixed early on and just accepting that failure and problems are inevitable and building, fixing them into our daily work, which is what we should be doing? Do people avoid responsibilities because taking on responsibilities just mean that they're going to have sleepless nights and then be fired? Do we define responsibilities narrowly so we know whose throat to choke when something goes wrong? Or do we share risks because we know that we're all working together to achieve the organizational outcomes that we want to achieve and failure is treated as something that we were going to learn from that's inevitable? Do we discourage people from talking to each other? Do we encourage that? Do we encourage people working together? And then two things that are particularly important. How do we deal with failure? How do we deal with things going wrong? And how do we deal with novelty? And they're two sides of the same coin. So failure is inevitable in complex systems. We work in complex systems. We build complex systems. Complex systems will inevitably drift into failure. You can't avoid that. So when something goes wrong, uh, and this, this happened very recently, um, there was a, a who heard about the, um, that big destroyer that crashed with a cargo ship recently um, in, in, at, near the Philippines somewhere? And there was an investigation report that was done, and the investigation report said that the people on the bridge in the destroyer had lost situational awareness. That was the end of the report. Well, obviously, that's what happened. Why did it happen? Why did those people lose situational awareness? Anytime something goes wrong, what you've got to ask yourself is, if I had been that person with the same information and resources available, could I have made the same mistake? And if we're honest, usually the answer is yes, I could have made the same mistake. So the question is, I mean, yes, there was human error. Of course, there's human error. We're humans. We error. So why do we error? How can we get people better information and better tools so that they have a better situational awareness and so that when things go wrong uh, and they make bad decisions, the outcomes aren't catastrophic, that they're contained instead? So failure is inevit inevitable. If your investigation leads to someone being fired or being blamed for it, that's terrible. You haven't addressed the problem. The next person who takes that person's job is going to have the same things happen to them, and you haven't done anything apart from, you know, wasted everyone's time and fired someone. And then the other side of this is, how do we deal with novelty? Does novelty lead to problems? Scope creep. Is it crushed? Or do we actually implement novelty? And again, if you're going to implement novelty, people won't take risks if they're scared of failing. So you have to have psychological safety. People have to not be scared to fail, otherwise they won't innovate and they won't try new things. Two sides of the same coin. So culture is really important. It's really hard to change. If you want to find more about changing culture, go to This American Life and check out the NUMI case study. It's a great podcast, N-U-M-M-I. Just search for that on This American Life. Uh, there's a transcript as well. It's great. I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about architecture. My favorite quote about internet architecture comes from this guy, Jesse Robbins. He, on his business card, when he worked at Amazon, his title was Master of Disaster. He was head of availability at Amazon. And he said this, back in 2007, by the way, success on the web depends on the ability to consistently create and deploy reliable software to an unreliable platform that scales horizontally. So in that one sentence, you've got 80% of what you need to know about building distributed systems at scale. It's great. You've got the continuous deployment bit, the continuous delivery bit. You've got the fact that your infrastructure is necessarily unreliable if you're working on a distributed system, and your software has to actually manage that uh, and be able to scale by scaling horizontally without um, single points of failure and shared dependencies. Well, guess what? That requires that you think about how to solve that problem and architect it in. The DevOps fairies are not going to fix your performance and scalability and security problems. You can't get to dev complete and then wave the magic DevOps wand and have sprinkle the pixie dust and magically make things scale and secure and perform and all that stuff. You have to build it in. Uh, and that's hard to do. It might take you uh, a bunch of time. And if you're working in a big enterprise system with a bunch of legacy, the DevOps transformation is not something where you're going to be able to do it like that. It may take years to do it. 
And I think the important thing to bear in mind is, number one, that's always going to be the case. Your architecture is necessarily going to change if you're successful. Every successful company is going to have different architectures throughout its life cycle, depending on what the needs of the organization are at that time. So architectural change is inevitable, and you have to embrace it and accept that it's, it's going to happen continuously. You're always going to be uh, evolving your architecture. And so who's seen the film Tomb Raider? Anyone seen the film Tomb Raider? OK. Um, so important lessons for architecture in that film. Um, this is a temple in Cambodia. And what happened is there was a tree growing on top of this temple. And then a little bird came and did a poop on the tree. And in the poop was a seed. And from the seed grew a strangler fig, which grew around the tree and strangled it. And all that's left now is this strangler fig. And the tree inside is dead. That's what you want to do to your nasty enterprise architecture. <laughs> so this pattern is called the strangler application pattern. Um, this, is what Martin Fowler, this is on Martin Fowler's blog, so you can go and search for it. Take your existing nasty monolithic architecture. Don't do a big bang rewrite. Instead, build a service-oriented architecture, microservices architecture, incrementally around that. And it can still talk to the monolithic stuff at the core of it, but you're gradually going to build around it and strangle it over time. And make sure the new stuff, you're following all these practices. You're doing test driven development. You're doing continuous integration. You're building nice, well-encapsulated code. And crucially, every service has to have its own database. Um, we saw this with service-oriented architectures. People were much more focused on, you know, am I using SOAP or WSDL rather than the actual architectural stuff that we care about? And we're going to see the same thing again with microservices. People are going to build these amazing things with Docker and Kubernetes, which still integrate against a central database and have to be deployed all in one big batch in a miserable, orchestrated weekends of doom. Uh, and we won't have achieved anything. Uh, You've got to make sure that when you're moving to a modern architecture, you care about these things like, can I test an individual service on my laptop without requiring an integrated environment? Can I deploy a single service to production on its own without needing a big orchestrated deployment of tens or hundreds of services at the same time? It's the outcomes that we care about. And you can achieve that with mainframes as easily as you can achieve it with you know, more modern technologies. And you can use Docker and Kubernetes and Jenkins and all the new shiny stuff and completely fail to achieve those things. So the outcomes are really important. The other piece is making sure that um, the developers are responsible for what they build. And developers have actually, you know, the decisions that the developers make, are we going to go use Node.js? Node.js is great. Let's use that. Well, guess what? Some poor operations person is going to have to maintain that for 30 years. You know, once upon a time, COBOL was as trendy as Node.js is right now. And in 30 years' time, Node.js is going to be the COBOL of the future. So who's going to be maintaining that? Who's going to be operating it? Well, one of the things, again, they did at Amazon, I love putting words into people's mouth. It's so fun. Uh, he actually said it, so it's OK. So this is Werner Vogel, CTO of Amazon. He says, you build it, you run it. The team that builds it has to operate it in production. Um, and even at Google, development teams have to run stuff in production for at least six months before they can hand it over and prove that it works and it's stable. In this model, we take the engineers who are in the middle. And I don't actually recommend burning your engineers. This is just for illustrative purposes. Uh, you treat your services as if they were products and organize around the different services. And you have all those skills on the team. So some people call this no ops, which I think is a terrible name, uh, because you still need operational skills. They're just decentralized into the teams. But crucially, they're deploying onto a platform that is also a product. So platform development is product development. Service development is product development. And instead of thinking in projects, we're, thinking we're taking a product-centric mindset to not only the services, but the platform that's built on it. So this is kind of the end goal. Um, treat everything as a service, including the platform, and build cross-functional teams that can develop and evolve those things throughout their life cycle. And we still got the machine that says, ping. So I have a couple of minutes left. 
I want to talk very briefly about the journey. You're never done with this stuff. DevOps and continuous delivery is not a, a destination. It's not a project where at the end of the project you're done and we can move on to the next thing. It's about always getting better at what we do. The one common characteristic of high performers is that they're always trying to get better. So number one is, what is the, what's the outcome we're looking for in measurable terms? So when people come and say to me, I want to do DevOps or I want to do continuous delivery, my first question is, why? How will you know when you're done? What's the measurable business goal you're trying to achieve? Make sure that you express that clearly in measurable terms. Do you want to be able to deploy um, every week to customers because you want to be able to get bug fixes out more quickly? Uh, are you trying to reduce costs? Are you trying to shorten time to market? Are you trying to improve quality? What is the outcome you're trying to achieve in measurable terms? And then communicate that very clearly to everyone so we all know what it is we're working towards. Number two, you can't expect teams to do this stuff and still carry on doing all the other things they're supposed to be doing. Enterprises have a terrible problem with this. They're like, okay, you're going to implement continuous delivery, and by the way, we need these features for Monday, right? So you can't, you've got to give teams capacity to be able to do this stuff, and, exp and, and you've got to spend money on, on the tools uh, and the time it takes to actually try a bunch of these things out and evolve. Teams are going to have to talk to each other. DevOps isn't the developer's problem, it's everyone's problem. Throughput isn't a development problem, it's everyone's problem. Reliability isn't an ops problem, it's everyone's problem. Quality isn't a testing problem, it's everyone's problem. So we're all going to have to work together to achieve these outcomes. Uh, my number one DevOps hack is to find someone on the team that you trash talk all the time, like the auditors, and go and buy them lunch. And spend an hour active listening to the things that make them super mad and sad, and then help them fix those things. Uh, you'd be amazed what that does. Uh, it's very, very powerful. So going and talking to other people is my number one DevOps hack, especially the people you wouldn't normally talk to that you think are going to be in your way, because you'll often find that they aren't, and they actually want the same things as you. It's going to take you months or years to achieve this. Find ways to establish quick wins, and then keep going. This is not a journey that's going to end in the near future. This is something we're going to have to keep working on. Please share your learnings as you go on this journey. Help the rest of the community. You've got an amazing community here in Jenkins. It's a really powerful, uh, supportive community. Share those learnings with each other. Talk about what you've done. Talk about what works and what doesn't. And uh, we'll find a way to achieve this all together. Thanks very much for your time. Have a great day. Thanks, Jez. Thank you. That was great. Thank you.